Hey everyone, welcome back to Brighter Rays. This week is Proverbs 5, and we're doing verses 1 through 14. And today we're looking at the idea of avoiding impurity. So this whole study, I called it bitter as wormwood. Today we're getting to that place. And uh, let's read the scripture, what we're looking at. And so we already went through verses 1 and 2 in the last time. So let's start with verse 3. It says, For the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps follow the path to Sheol. She does not ponder the path of life. Her ways wander, and she does not know it. And now, O oh sons, listen to me, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far from her, and do not, let, do not go near the door of her house. Lest you give your honor to others, and your years to the merciless. Lest strangers take their fill of your strength, and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. And at the end of your life you groan when your flesh and body are consumed, and you say, How I hated discipline. And my heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. I am at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. Thus says the Lord. So, first thing I think we see here is don't listen to temptation, right? The temptation is like, he says, the, her lips are like um, like honey, right? They drip honey. Her speech is smoother than oil. That's the idea of tempting, of, of kind of drawing you in, right? It's like, ooh, it's like honey. You know, what she's saying is, is so sweet, and, and her speech is just so smooth. It's, it's, she's a smooth talker. And uh, so that's what we're talking about here. But Solomon says, yeah, but remember, to listen to her is fatal. It is fatal to listen to her. First of all, it destroys the conscience. That's the idea here of, of the bitter as wormwood. It's, it, 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 your conscience is just embittered. It's destroyed. It's, you get her in, it's like, it just, you know, yeah, it sounds like, it sounds like, uh, you know, honey it's it, ooh, it smells sounds so good but in the end it really is bitterness that she's offering to you it's really just something that you don't want and uh, jeremiah 9 15 uh, it says that the, therefore the, thus the says the lord of hosts the god of israel behold i will feed this people with bitter food and give them poisonous water to drink now is he actually giving them um <laughs> bitter food is he giving them poisonous water not literally. What is he doing? Because he, then he says, I will scatter them among the nations who neither they nor their fathers have known, and I will send the sword after them until I consume them. He's saying, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to embitter them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take away their good. Their, you know, they got good feelings right now, right? They're feeling all right. They, th they think they got it all figured out. But God says, nope, you're going to be eating some bitter food. You're going to be eating some, po drinking some poisonous water. You know that's the where um what's that pair that's that phrase uh that we often use um uh, i can't remember what it just came to my mind and then it just disappeared but uh you can figure it out but you know the idea that is that yeah you, you take something in and it's like sweet but then really in the end it's bitterness it's it's it's, it's something you want to spit out that's what god was going to do to the nation here in Jeremiah 9 because they thought they were all good with God but he says no I'm gonna make you I'm gonna give you some bitterness as wormwood I'm gonna I'm gonna make you um, want to spit this out it's not gonna be good man and then over in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 um, <clears throat> it says uh, in ver you can start in verse 25 it says I turn my heart to know and to search out to seek wisdom and the scheme of things and to know the wickedness of folly and the foolishness that is madness. And I find something more bitter than death. So he says, I turn myself to search all these things, to find these things. And what is worse than death? What is more bitter than death? The woman whose heart is snares and nets, whose hands are fetters. He who pleases God escapes her, but the sinner is taken by her. See, something that's more bitter than death is the woman with the, uh, with the smooth words, right? with the honey dripping lips oh i'm so i'm so great you know and you're such a great man i love you so much 
just smooth talking. What does that take you to? When he says, her feet go down to death, her steps follow the path to Sheol. Well, there you go. That's what, it only leads to death. Death and hell. Her feet go down to death, and her steps lead down to Sheol, the grave. Sheol, and now the hell, you know, takes you down to hell. That's where she's taking you. That's where her, her steps are leading you to. So you're going to follow this woman? You're going to follow this sexual immorality? Guess where you're heading? Death? Hell. It's pretty clear. I mean, you don't really, I mean, he doesn't even really go on beyond that. It's like, okay, dude, I get it, man. If I go after this forbidden woman, then I'm toast. You know? <laughs> All I got is bitterness, death, and hell. Great. Awesome. That's what I want. No. Obviously, that's foolishness. But he also says, remember that these are empty promises, right? These are empty promises. He wants you to remember, you know, that's fatal listen to her, but then also the promises that she makes are empty promises. He says, um, she does not ponder the path of life, right? Her ways wander, and she does not know it. In a way he's wandering, she doesn't even know it. So she's saying, yeah, well, the, these are empty promises. That smooth speech, right? It's just emptiness. There's nothing behind it. She doesn't even ponder the path of life. She's not even thinking about what her actions are doing. There's nothing that makes one think about the course of their life in that. That's what, it's completely devoid of, like, reality. Right? Because it's just... That's where the sexual immorality is so, so devious. Because there's nothing in there that makes you think about the reality of, of what's going to happen, right? Pregnancy, you know, divorce, and, um, you know, disease, and death, and all those things. You, we don't even think about that. That's what's so tempting about sexual immorality is that none of that is there. Like, you know, everything you're doing here is making you bitter and leading you to hell. That's what Solomon's saying. Everything you're going to do with this person, everything you're going to do, all this sexual morality that you're thinking about doing, guess what? It leads you down to hell. Leads you to death. Leads you to bitterness. Leads you to nothing good. It sounds good. It looks good. But in the end, it's just death. It doesn't do anything for you. It's foolishness to follow. It's, it's not wise. There's nothing in there that makes you think about what's going to happen down the road. There's no thinking about consequences. That's what he's saying here. Her feet go down to death. Her steps follow, you know, her, her steps follow the path of Sheol. She does not ponder the path of life. She's not thinking about where the life is going. Her ways wander, and she doesn't even know it, though. That's the second point. The wicked unwittingly wander from the path of life. They don't even know they've wandered from it. That's the problem. Like, in this sexual morality, like, the, the person that you're going to commit this with has wandered off the path of life. They don't even know they've gone. And this is the person you want to be with? This is the immorality that you want to commit? Foolishness. Complete and utter foolishness. It doesn't make any sense. Why would you do that? Psalm 35. Turn over there. Psalm 35, 7 through 8 says, For without cause they hid their net for me. Without cause they dug a pit for my life. Let destruction come upon him when he does not know it, and let the net that he hid ensnare him. Let him fall into it to his own destruction. See, that's the thing. They're caught in their own destruction. That's the that's the prayer of the psalmist. Like, why are they they're putting nets against me? They're digging pits for my life. Well, let their destruction fall upon themselves. All right? Let them be caught in their own destruction. That's what it says here. She doesn't know it. She, she doesn't ponder the way of life. She's going to be caught in her own destruction. This temptation to sin, this temptation to sexual impurity and immorality is only going to lead you to destruction. And they're going to be caught in their own destruction because they're not pondering the way of their life. They didn't even think about it. Right? That's usually how sexual morality works. Well, we got into this situation, and then we got pregnant. Well, how'd you get pregnant? <laughs> you, know, it's like, you didn't ponder the way of your life? You didn't understand that there's consequences? You didn't realize that you were going to get this disease from this person? From your actions that you were doing? You didn't know that? 
well, it's pretty obvious. Like, the, the facts are there. What's going to happen or could happen is there. It's just that you didn't ponder or think about the way of life. You know, your, your addiction to pornography is going to lead you to problems with your life, guaranteed. If you don't see that right now, you got a problem, man. You got a problem. If you're, or ladies, if you're obsessed with romance novels and all this other kind of stuff, romance, and, and it's not your husband, and you're not seeking romance of your husband, and going everywhere else to find it, even if he doesn't do it, guess what that's leading you? It's leading you to hell. It's leading you to death. It's leading, leading you to bitterness, to wormwood. You become the wormwood. You're the bitter one. You're the one that people want to spit out after they know you. But know that there's consequences. These are empty promises. There's real consequences for doing these things. And you need to ponder the path. You need to be not be like this person who just wanders away and doesn't even she doesn't even know it. I don't know what, what is this gonna do to me. I, I you know I didn't even realize that I would get pregnant. Come on, man, seriously, yeah. You're not pondering the way. You're a fool. That's what the Bible's saying. This is the fool. It's not wise. It's foolishness. And where does foolishness lead you? To death and hell. That's it. But Solomon's not done yet. He's not done. This is, it's it's bad enough already, right? So stay away from the forbidden woman. We got that. But guess what? That leads you to all kinds of problems. Stay away from the forbidden man. <clears throat> Don't do that. And that comes in lots of forms. We already understand that, right? So then we get into verse 7. Again, he says, listen to me. This is important. Listen to me. He says it again. Solomon please again. The danger is real, and it is great. Listen. Don't depart. So there's a warning keep away right he says keep away from it keep away keep your way far from her do not go near the door of her house don't go near so we should be afraid to go near this sin like this is a real warning don't go there keep keep your way far from her be afraid don't even go near her house it says don't even go near her door don't go by her home stay far away there should be a fear here of this I don't want to go near there because there's real temptation. There's real sin there. So if we know we need to figure this out as Christians, if there's something in our lives that's tempting us to sexual morality, there's real temptation there. We need to figure out where it's coming from. Where, why is this some temptation coming to us? And then second of all, I need to be afraid to go near that. I should be like, holy smokes, there it is. I got to get away from it. Oh, there it is again. I'm running away. Get away. Get away. You know? It's like, uh, you know, what they would do with lepers. Unclean, unclean. That's what you need to be like. You shouldn't be like, hmm, I'll just walk. By. You know, going past her house is easier. I'll just go back that way. No problem. No, there should be a real fear that if you walk down there, that's a real possibility that that could be a temptation for you. So, and we should be taking steps to avoid sin, right? We That's implied here, too. Do not go near the door of her house. Take steps. Like, if you're walking down the street and you know her house is there, go down a different street. So he's saying take real steps. Take steps to avoid sin. This is not just like, oh, I will always be impervious to sin. You know, it's like, no, it's the idea like God's telling you, here's wisdom. You know where her house is at, right? Yeah. Then don't go over there. What? You know, take real steps. Make a plan. Go a different way. He's sorry. He's warning you that that's gonna happen so he's saying do something different so we need to do that too we need to make plans so if we can figure out where is this temptation why do i always fall into this temptation of sin why am i being tempted to commit adultery with this person figure it out if that's it's the person right then run be afraid of falling into sin when you're near that person and then take steps to avoid the sin we should be jealous for our holiness jealous for it we shouldn't be desiring of that that's kind of implied here too keep away from her you know do not depart from the words of his mouth listen don't go away from that keep away from her do not go near the door of her house all right don't go even near it 
be jealous for it. Keep it to yourself, man. Keep your holiness. You know that temptation, that, that falling into sin is right there in front of you. Don't do it. Jesus talked about this too, right? In Matthew chapter 5, he talks about this idea. And in verse 27, you've heard it's, that it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks on a woman, at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. So he's saying you need to get violent against this sin. If there's, if there's something that's causing you to sin, cut it out of your life. Right? Don't play, don't play nicey-nice with that. You know what it is? Be brutal. You gotta cut. If it's a person, you're gonna have to cut that person out of your life. If it's you know online, then you might have to come. You might have to chuck that computer. You gotta do something. You gotta do something. You gotta take real steps. You know this is not this is not playtime here. You're at war. And this sin is winning. You gotta get violent. You gotta kill that sucker. Take it out. Murder it. Number three, <clears throat> there's, here's the reason to avoid impurity. Let's look at that. The reason to avoid impurity shows up in the next part of our text here. And it says, um, Lest you give your honor to others and your years to the merciless, lest strangers take the fill um, <clears throat> of your strength and your labors go to the house of a foreigner and at the end of your life you groan when your flesh and body are consumed. And they continue on, and you say, "So these are the consequences. This is the reason, and really, the, you know, the reason. We'll get into the consequences in a minute, but the reason why you should avoid impurity. First, he says, it destroys your honor. You get in, involved in sexual immorality. You're doing things you shouldn't be doing with other people, with nobody. Um, it destroys your honor. You are not lo no longer an honorable person. Second, it wastes your time." But those who are cruel, you're spending your time with these people who will have no problem stealing your strength, right? Taking you everything you have. Uh, so that's what it says. It wastes your time. Let strangers take the fill of your strength. They're taking what should be devoted to the Lord, what should be giving you blessing, right? Because we already talked about that. Walking down the good path will bring you blessing. So you should be doing something where God's going to bless you. But instead, you're over here messing around with this, where all you're going to get is you know, curses, and in the end, and sin and destruction. Why do you want to go that way? Doesn't make any sense. So waste your time with those who are cruel. Third, it wastes your money. It wastes money. You know that sexual morality often, often involves losing your stuff. <laughs> you know, sometimes it ends in divorce, and you lose all your money that way. Sometimes people are paying, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars to indulge sexual immorality online you know sometimes it, you know you get diseases from sexual immorality and so uh, it's going to cost you medical bills so you see oftentimes that's the case it's going to steal your money that's what he says and your labors go to the house of a foreigner everything you worked for now is going to go to somebody else that doesn't even, they're not even related to you right they're going to take all your money because of this sexual immorality you did you know, divorce law is a very lucrative business. So, you make people are making big money off of people making horrible mistakes, not even mistakes, making horrible choices, and then having to live with the consequences. Not really a mistake. You did it on purpose, obviously. Uh, and then finally, it destroys your body. That's what it says. Your flesh and body are consumed. Now, that could be figurative or literal, and it's actually both. <laughs> Sometimes it's figurative, um, you know, because of the guilt and, and guilt of sin and the shame that comes with it. Um, but it also destroys your body, uh, you know, because of disease and things like that. And so if you're sexually pure, you don't have to worry about that. Uh, but, you know, people, you, know, you see people that do that. It destroys their body, destroys their mind. It can do all kinds of horrible things to you. So sexual, sexual immorality is not just something that eh, everyone does it. It's not a big deal. Well, guess what? It leads to hell and death. 
horrible deaths sometimes, painful deaths sometimes. Uh, you lose all your stuff, you know, waste your money, waste your time, destroys your honor, and destroys your body. Okay, great, sold, that's what I want. No, no one wants that. If they really were wise, they would say, this is the stupidest thing ever, why would I do that? That's exactly right. <laughs> that brings us to our fourth point today. Um, and that is, if you engage in impurity and come to your senses, here's what you're going to say. This is what Solomon says. Guess what? One day, you go down this road, you go down this path with the forbidden person, with this sexual immorality. Guess what's going to happen? One day, hopefully, you'll wake up and it'll say, How I hated discipline. My heart despised reproof. I did not listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors. I am at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. <clears throat> So there you go. It's first, you say, I hated discipline and reproof. My teachers, my instructors were telling me the truth, and I despised them. I hated their discipline. I hated their reproof. Ultimately, I hated God's discipline. I hated God's reproof because it came through these instructors, through these people, through Solomon right in front of us. He's telling us right now, he is your instructor. And if you go down that road, you indulge in sexual morality, whatever kind it is, you will hopefully one day, hopefully one day, this is the case, hopefully one day you will say, how I hated discipline and reproof. Because that means you realize, wait a minute, I did something horrible. Now whether it's in this life, maybe people will say that when they're in hell. I don't know. That could be part of the punishment, right? Part of the torment. Like, well, wait a minute. I had all these instructors. I had all these things. And uh, I despised reproof and their instruction. Here it appears to be like, before it actually destroys you and you realize wait a minute i've gone down the road too far and so this is talking to someone who knows the lord who has feared the lord but then is a fool in a lot of what they're doing but they realize that they hated discipline and reproof and then they also you will say i hated those who tried to help me like i hated discipline and reproof but i also hated those teachers i didn't listen to the voice of my teachers or incline my ear to my instructors i hated those people that were trying to help me you see that happens so many times, too. It's like pastors, teachers, parents, other siblings are trying to warn these people, hey, don't do this. Get out of this. Run away from it. Go now. And they just, like, I hate you. Get away from me. And then they go off and do whatever they want, you know, whatever sexual morality they want to indulge in. You know, whether it's homosexual relationships or transgenderism or pornography or adultery or whatever it might be. You know, they just go off and do it and say, hey, I don't want to hear you. Don't tell me what's right. I can do what I want. I, this is my life, you know. And then what happens? Horrible things. You know, they lose their honor. They, they waste their time with those who are cruel. They lose time. They waste their money. They waste their body. All that time that they could be being blessed by the Lord, they've wasted that. And what do they have to show for it? Nothing. Now the foreigner has everything they have. Now they have no time left because they're growing older. And their body is falling apart. They got the impurity, but that's all they got. So they hated those who tried to help them. And then you will say, I'm at the edge of losing everything. He says, I'm at the brink of utter ruin here. Utter loss of all things. Man, that's, that's like the prodigal son. Right? He, gets, he comes to me like, I had so much better... I've got nothing here. I, I wish I could eat what the pigs are eating. That'd be better than what I have now. I'm at the brink of utter ruin. Right? He indulged in sexual morality, and where did it get him? Nothing. He's at the edge of utter ruin. All he has left is to die. A horrible death, alone. If that's what you want? No, I'm at the edge of losing everything. My life is on the brink, and I've got nothing to show for it. I've sent nothing on ahead. I got nothing. And then he says, I'm at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. That is a very interesting phrase there. Because what it means is that I am completely humbled. I am completely laid bare. I'm completely exposed, completely humiliated in front of the church. 
I was going to say completely humbled, but I think it's really humiliation, right? It's not you're humbled. It's that you've been humiliated. I'm completely humiliated in front of the church. Why do I say the church? Because it says the assembled congregation here. It's actually kind of interesting because in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation that was translated before Christ, um, they used the word ekklesias, which is the Greek word for church, which in the New Testament is used for church. We translate as church. It's really just the assembly. And so in the first word is the assembled. It's actually two nouns. So it's kind of weird that the, the, NI, the ESV uses it as an adjective because it's actually two nouns there. I am in utter ruin in the assembly and the congregation. But there's no... Um, there's no... Uh, connection there there there's no there's no and there so it's this and this so it's this this so it's the ecclesias synagogue so the synagogue in the church and the synagogue which is pretty interesting <coughs> which is in the you know if we would translate it in english we would say the church and the synagogue if you're doing it if it was a new testament but here we take it back it's like well it's in the church it's amongst god's people that's what he's talking about those who actually believe, which distinguishes it from everybody else, right? I am completely humiliated in front of the church, in front of the God's people. I'm, I'm here. I'm in front of the ecclesias, and I am embarrassed. I am humiliated. I am a fool. And that's what you get. That's, that's what he says. That's, I'm at the brink of utter ruin in the assembled congregation. I've got nothing else. I've lost everything. In the church, I'm humiliated. I mean, you know, look at these. How can I show my face here? And there's that shame. That is, we're talking about real shame. You know, amongst God's people, I, I am almost, I'm almost out of it. I'm almost out of it. You know, the only way I'm getting in heaven, like all of us, is, but you realize that, like, wow, I have nothing. All I can do is go home to my father. Like the prodigal son, all you can do is go home. I hope that he takes me back, because I've got nothing here. This is, that's this is this is what the prodigal son story. This is what he uses. This is what Jesus uses as the prodigal son story. Proverbs or yeah, Proverbs five. It's like guess what? But the father was there to take him back, right? I'm on the brink of utter ruin. But you come back. You come to your senses. That's what. Jesus said in, in the prodigal son, he came to his senses. I, I got nothing. In front, of the, in front of God's people, I am, there's nothing here. <laughs> I'm completely humiliated and embarrassed in front of them. And rightfully so, right? Rightfully so. Um, if you look at Numbers 25, I just wanted to point this out. Uh, Numbers 25, 6, it says, Behold, one... One of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel while they were weeping in the entrance of the tent of meeting. In the whole congregation there is the word ecclesia in front of the whole congregation or the, you know, the assembly. Um, it is interesting. When the Pharisee, when Phineas, the son of Eleazar, son of Aaron the priest, saw it, he rose and left the congregation, again, the ecclesia, and took a spear in his hand and went after the man of Israel into the chamber and pierced both of them, the man of Israel and the woman, through her belly. Thus the plague of the people of Israel was stopped. And so here you have this sexual immorality. He went after the forbidden woman and did it in sight of everybody else. And Phineas took him out. But he says, look at he, how he's utterly embarrassed. He's on, he, this man was on the brink of utter destruction in the assembly, right? He's doing it in front of the assembly. But what does he do? You know, he sins. He doesn't come to his senses. He actually commits the sin. And he meets, he's met with swift justice there, too, at the hands of Phineas. And then Job 30, 28, it says, I go about darkened, but not by the sun. I stand in the assembly and cry for help. And so here is that same word again, the assembly, the, the church. Uh, he's standing amongst God's people and saying, help me, <laughs> I'm embarrassed here. 
And it's not because for him it wasn't because of sin, not because of sexual morality, but here he is, he's crying out amongst God's people. I stand up in the assembly, in the ecclesia, and cry out for help. Very interesting, very interesting concept there. Um, I won't get more into that, but you see the connection there. Um, so we can definitely apply that today. And that's what we'll do next time when we get together. We'll look at the of our studies. So, 